on air, online, on your smartphone too. And you are FM 103.7. As we take a look at some of the things that are happening in the world of education, we do that with John Fischetti uh, from the University of Newcastle, our Professor of Education there. And John, as always, let's, I mean, we should take a moment to admire the threads of this guy. I mean, he always looks like he stepped straight out of a men's fashion magazine. No, just out of another meeting, Mark. <laughs> of another meeting. Can I turn up to some of these meetings in the T-shirt? Do you think that'll go I all right? I think we both have the face for radio, so okay. we're fine. <laughs> we're okay. Fair enough. Um, this new concept, well, I'm not sure how new it is. It's probably been uh, done in other parts of the world as well. The thing called Teach for Australia, where we get uh, mid-career professionals to come into the classroom and impart some of their knowledge there. How does it work? On face value, John, it seems like it's an okay idea, but as always, there might be something in the detail here. Absolutely, Mark. And it is a good idea. It hasn't worked in other places, but there's ways it could work. Mm. Right now in New South Wales, we have a several thousand person teacher shortage emerging and not a lot of people coming in behind it to fill it. One of the solutions that's been used in the UK and the US is to get really bright university graduates who may not have chosen teaching, put them in an intense and compressed program without as many placement opportunities, and put them in the very hard-to-staff situations. So in the U.S., I did a study of in the city of New Orleans, after Hurricane Katrina, the government decided not to restaff schools when they opened them with the regular accredited teachers, much to the union chagrin, I might mm-hmm. say. And they hired a bunch of very bright uni grads, gave a compressed few-month program, and stuck them into situations that were really complex, high poverty, high need in facilities that weren't great. The problem is the exodus was nearly 50% in the first two years. Those people weren't well prepared to meet the needs of young children with poverty. And in rural areas, the lifestyle that the people were then leading wasn't sort of comfortable with living in the bush. They were used to being in the city because most of the people were imports. Mm -hmm. That creates a lot of churn for kids. It creates and exaggerates the problem because now you've burned up that generation of people. And so probably this solution, which the premier has announced in New South Wales, sounds really good. There'd be 50 people, particularly in STEM, we'll put them where we can't find teachers. But it's counterproductive if you think about, would you take a newbie out of medical school and put them in the most difficult emergency department day one? Or would you give them some additional internships and training? That's where this falls off and probably will actually fail. Answer that question first. You probably wouldn't. (laughs) Um, But secondly, I know we've talked a lot, and this is a thing that's come up quite often, that you mentioned those regional and rural areas that are very hard to fill but and already have those issues with people coming in. It's like, oh, I'll do my, my time in the bush for a couple of years, right. and then they're gone. Um, are, is this an example of just throwing more people in to do their time in the bush and leaving, and the, 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 the wheel just keeps on moving around? Well, it's a sidetrack from the issue that's been presented by teachers since COVID, which is an interesting, complex thing that we appreciated teachers during when we were locked down, and now somehow we're not realizing that the stress and strains and the wear and tears of teachers means the working conditions really hard. Many teachers are now bureaucrats and assessment specialists, even in the early years, where they're just taking assessments and writing them down as opposed to teaching. And other areas are handing them scripts and saying, you're not a teacher, just read this all day. Teachers are worn out from the burden of the administrative component. This doesn't do anything to that. It just throws new firefighters in to take a bushfire that's already out of control. It is a good idea that we find incentives to bring people to teaching. So that part of the idea is great. But if you're just doubling down on recycling people through, the next generation behind isn't behind it. So I think it's actually going to exaggerate the issue. All right. Well, here's a thought. You mentioned, John, that there's so much admin work and so much paperwork behind the scenes. This can be a byproduct of anything that ha- that that is this part of government, and in teaching, it's a government profession. So maybe just remove some of the big government right. style, um, you know, work that bureaucracy. Have, bureaucracy. Right. That's the <laughs> yeah. word. Thank you. Remove some of that, yep. and then you might actually have people that want to go. And, I didn't go into teaching to sit, you know, and and do all this bureaucracy stuff. I just want to go out and teach. Maybe just make the that load a little bit lighter, and you'll actually have people go. I want to stick around. You've hit it on the head there. Uh, Mark, because that's what new teachers who are leaving more quickly than Mm. before COVID are saying is about that administrative part. We got to bring the joy back to teaching. That will be its own incentive because it's a call 
calling as much as it is a science. But if we really want the best to do it, we're going to have to have the scholarships. We'll have to have forgivable loans. We'll have to have some housing support for people to go to places. But we'll also have to address that in certain suburbs, even in our listening area, it's become really hard. Working families are struggling. Uh, their kids bring issues to school. And we don't want to throw people in not prepared with the classroom management, the understanding of poverty, the issues that young people are bringing, because otherwise you end up in this battle zone in schools. That'll look much more like what you can see on Netflix or <laughs> on uh, the, yeah. the news coming out of the US. We don't need to go there. It has already failed. So the issue of finding those folks is great, particularly in the STEM areas also. Those folks tend to like math and like science. They'd be teaching kids that don't intuitively, and you have to have the time to practice. So why our programs in universities take a little longer is we have two or three formal placements. You wouldn't want to put a pilot in a plane who's never flown a plane in simulation. So we need to give more practice. So these shortcut programs would be like rushing a surgeon in to do heart surgery before they've actually done anatomy. And we wouldn't do it in almost any other profession uh, without a little practice. We have driving practice for hundreds of hours where you're supervised. We want to make sure we do, don't um, mess it all up here in teaching. It's a shortcut approach. Sounds good. In the end, won't work. Sorry, Premier. <laughs> Sounds good. Doesn't work. It's great. It's a, it's a great <laughs> slogan. Uh, and mind you, I'll just point out very quickly, John, that some of us did get our, did get our driver's license when you didn't have to have those hundreds of hours as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll all put our hands up. Uh, all right, our Professor of Education, always a good chat with John Fischetti. Thank you so much for your time. We'll get Thanks you on a fortnight right here at 2 RFM 103.7. A broadcast service of the University of Newcastle.